it's Caitlin from C-SPAN. Did you know that C-SPAN has been serving the American people for 45 years? Since our founding in 1979, C-SPAN has been documenting history with a unique approach, unfiltered, without commentary, and entirely independent from government funding. C-SPAN is funded by fees from our cable and satellite distribution partners. And now, with fewer people subscribing to cable and satellite, we're asking you to help support our next 45. Your contribution helps to ensure that we can continue to provide unfiltered, complete coverage of government proceedings on TV, online, on radio, and our mobile app, as well as context through newsletters, social media, and podcasts. Join us in preserving this legacy of access to the democratic process. Make your tax-deductible donation today at cspan.org slash donate. Thank you. David Charter, author of Royal Audience. You're gonna be part of a C-SPAN first. We're gonna read a recipe. The recipe called for four teacups flour, four tablespoons castor sugar, two teacups milk, two whole eggs, two teaspoons bicarbonate of soda, three teaspoons cream of tartar, and two more tablespoons melted butter. It instructed, beat egg, sugar, and about half the milk together, add flour, and mix well together, adding remainder of milk as required, also bicarbonate and cream of tartar, fold in the melted butter. What and whose recipe is this? Uh, and I, I thought I was on the Royal Show, not the recipe <laughs> show. But it's, uh, it's a very uh, remarkable recipe that the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, the late Queen uh, of Great Britain, gave to uh, the President, President Eisenhower uh, after he had had what really is um, a remarkable uh, special treatment from the royal family, that was he was invited to Balmoral Castle. That's the uh, summer holiday retreat of the royal family, a private place where very few members, even of British high society, get to go, let alone share a picnic where the queen makes drop scones, uh, a kind of pancake uh, that, the, uh, that Eisenhower enjoyed so much that the queen said, I will send you the recipe. And when she was uh, a few weeks later, she was actually she was withdrawn a little because she was pregnant at the time. She saw a photograph of Eisenhower in the papers and, and it reminded her, I must send the recipe to Ike. So she had it typed up and in her own hand, she wrote a few bits of extra guidance at the bottom uh, and sent off the recipe. And why was Eisenhower special because of their shared experience, generation, etc.? Well, I've looked at the Queen's relationship over her whole 70-year reign with the 13 presidents that she knew. And it's, it's pretty clear when you look at how the royal family uh, collectively, but uh, also the Queen, uh, related to Eisenhower, that he was a standout president uh, for them. And I say, and I think it's pretty clear, it goes back to her formative years in the Second World War, when she saw the GIs come over, she was in those meetings as a teenager, actually, sometimes with her father, George VI and, and Eisenhower. And it was a big, the biggest moment, almost the turning point of the Second World War. D-Day, 1944. Eisenhower was in charge of the operation. It went brilliantly. Sadly, many lives are lost, including many Americans, of course. The Queen never forgot that sacrifice uh, and that remarkable achievement, the reinvasion of Europe. Uh, and through her whole life, uh, as her first Prime Minister Winston Churchill told her, we have a special relationship with America. You must keep the Americans close. It was the mission of her whole life. And it's and Eisenhower was one of her first presidents who made that easy for her to achieve. And Queen Elizabeth had a horse named Eisenhower as well. Remarkably, the horses that pulled the royal state coach at her coronation were named after famous generals, and one of the horses was called Eisenhower. The Queen took her reign beginning 6 February 1952. 14 American presidents, Biden, Trump, Obama, George W. Bush, Clinton, George H. W. Bush, Reagan, Carter, Ford, Nixon, Johnson, Kennedy, Eisenhower, and Truman, 
That's 14, but the subtitle of your book is 70 Years and 13 Presidents, One Queen's Special Relationship with America. Who's left out there? Well, you included him in your list. Uh, obviously, he's part of the American history, but sadly not one that the Queen met while he was sitting president, LBJ. There are reasons for this, which um, we go, I go into in the book. There are uh, accidental, if you like, reasons that when JFK was assassinated, she was planning, she would have liked to go to the funeral of a sitting head of state who, who died in such tragic circumstances. She couldn't go, her doctors prevented her because she was too heavily pregnant uh, at the time. Uh, when Churchill died a couple of years later, LBJ wanted to come, but he got sick during his inauguration in January 1965, and his doctors prevented him from traveling uh, to the UK. So if it wasn't for those unfortunate um, accidents of history, they would have met. But what happened, of course, was that, Eisenhower, uh, was that LBJ's full term became completely overwhelmed with Vietnam, and he was angry with the British uh, under their Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, who would not commit troops to Vietnam. And he basically had little time for those countries that weren't assisting. He focused on the countries and visiting uh, and entertaining leaders from the countries that were assisting in Vietnam. How important was her sister Margaret's visit to the US and where she met LBJ? That's right. So there was kind of a makeup uh, visit that uh, LBJ already knew Margaret from uh, previous en engagements, uh, the uh, independence uh, celebrations in Jamaica, I think, for example. Uh, and so when Margaret announced her first big royal tour of America, the British establishment did not want it to be all glamorous parties in Hollywood, which Margaret probably wanted it to be, but because she, she knew LBJ a little, uh, it was fixed up that she would have a dinner at the White House. Uh, and so while the Queen did not meet uh, LBJ, there was um, a, a, rather, um, a rather glamorous and famous occasion, actually. LBJ wasn't one for parties. Uh, it was, I think, perhaps the biggest White House party dinner uh, of the entire administration, uh, where she sat on the uh, sat next to the president uh, and everyone had a fine old time and in LBJ who was recovering from an, another illness and an operation at the time, uh, perhaps against doctor's advice, uh, took to the dance floor with Margaret. Did that improve Anglo-American relations at the time? That's a good question. I think L um, it, it is said that LBJ never bore a real grudge against Britain uh, that would be damaging to the special relationship. It was, it was said that uh, he, his problem was with Harold Wilson, the, the Labour Prime Minister, who was refusing to commit British troops because that would have caused him immense trouble with his own uh, party back home. And so I think that when you get uh, a royal visitation like that, history shows us throughout the, throughout the book as well that, it, that the, the atmosphere ge generally definitely improves. The publicity surrounding it is so normally very positive uh, that relations are kept at a, uh, at a special level. It's, 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 it's not every country that can uh, arrange to have uh, a member of its leading family uh, attend a dinner at the White House and a dinner that by all accounts, for example, Lady Bird Johnson uh, was really excited uh, uh, to, to be able to host for a change in the, L in, uh, in the LBJ White House. But you also write in Royal Audience, Mr. Charter, that the Queen later, later met Lady Bird Johnson. That's right. Uh, on a subsequent visit uh, to Texas, uh, she was able to, to meet her. In fact, she met various um, other first ladies and former presidents. She met former President Hoover on one of her trips as well. I know that the 13 uh, sitting presidents is in the title of the book, but you can see that her, the wealth of her connections and meetings with uh, senior American politicians was really extraordinary. I don't think it would have been repeated by anyone else in history. Now you conjecture along with Dwight Eisenhower, she had some other favorites. Who do you mention? 
Right, I think because this was so difficult for me to pin down one favourite, I thought, I think there are several that stand out. So I, I, I really came down for Eisenhower. That's obvious and clear. Um, I spoke to Susan Eisenhower, his granddaughter, about it, and she gave me lots of nice details about uh, how, for example, Eisenhower painted the young Charles and Anne, because Eisenhower was a, uh, a famous, famously hobby hobby painter, good, quite a good one. Um, but from her own greatest generation, if you like, she really did get on with Reagan, and probably what viewers will know if they know anything about the relationship with the, between the Queen and Presidents is the famous horse ride that was arranged between the Queen and Reagan uh, in Windsor Park uh, when uh, he visited in 1982 that was really symbolic. I don't think you'd ever see anywhere else an American president sharing a horse ride with another world leader, really, uh, or indeed any, any leaders going to the trouble uh, or perhaps having the delight of doing such uh, an event for the cameras. But I also say that it, it, it was pretty clear to me that she got on famously with the Bushes, especially George H.W. Bush. Uh, and that was also partly because uh, of Barbara Bush. I think she she really liked and respected this dog-loving, animal-loving matriarch with a big family and slightly troublesome uh, sons. Uh, that uh, perhaps was something they had in common. Uh, and they got along famously uh, just because of, of that similarity. And then I also say from the younger generation, the post-war generation, it's pretty clear that uh, a, a really nice relationship developed with the Obamas uh, late on in the Queen's life, of course. Uh, and it wasn't clear to the British that uh, Obama liked Great Britain and was that interested in Europe uh, um, as, as much as, say, the people of Great Britain were seemed to be rather enthusiastic about him. And so he got special treatment from the Queen, but they clicked immediately. Uh, and you can see, by the way, for example, when Michelle Obama and the girls were privately travelling in London. They got invited to Buckingham Palace and, and the girls got a, a carriage ride around the grounds of Buckingham Palace, all privately, no media, but just a sign of a close relationship. You describe Queen Elizabeth II as the undisputed jewel of UK diplomacy. It, no question for me uh, that uh, she was... Um, on many levels, uh, a fantastic uh, but also necessary um, performer for our country. Now, this works on the superficial level, if you like, of publicity and fantastic photographs and finery and pomp and circumstance. But when you look at what she did and when she had her meetings, they were rather strategically placed. She had a big state visit to America in the 1950s after the Suez Crisis, when Eisenhower was furious with Britain. He wanted to bankrupt the country. To, he, was, he hadn't been told Britain was going to invade Egypt. He thought this, this, this could precipitate a conflagration with the Soviet Union, maybe. So she, was, she went over to do the, the repair job, if you like, uh, between Britain and America. And this was, this was the case in different ways uh, through, throughout her reign, as I mentioned with the actually the, the real fears about Obama, also about President Biden. Did he really like the UK? Was he rather fond of Ireland and uh, Irish republicanism uh, that, so that he, he wouldn't be thinking, thinking favourably towards uh, Britain? So what happens is when he comes over as part of a, a G7 meeting, it's only one of the seven leaders gets invited to Windsor Castle. Guess who? It's President Biden. He gets the uh, the tea and crumpets with the Queen. David Charter, where did the term special relationship come from? That's, uh, that's all down to Winston Churchill, our wartime prime minister, who came back into office in the 1950s, just at the time when Elizabeth came to the throne. He was her first prime minister. And he gave a speech in America, in Missouri, at the invitation uh, of President Truman, uh, While well, he was out of office, actually, Churchill at the time, but he was friendly with Truman from their um, interactions at the end of the wartime period. And it's best known for the phrase, an iron curtain is falling over Europe. But also in that same speech, he outlined what he thought should be the special relationship between 
Britain and its Commonwealth uh, and America, not just militarily, by the way, culturally and scientific research uh, and education as, as well. Um, but it's also become rather associated with the fact that at the time, Britain and Europe were still heavily dependent upon American largesse and funding to rebuild after the Second World War. So some historians view it as a, as a, as a little bit um, uh, of a dependency with this, where it's special pleading, if you like, a bit special on one, more special on one side than the other. Uh, but what the Queen managed to do through her reign was establish this term of Churchill's um, as a partnership um, of equals uh, in terms uh, of the level of involvement that tr with, with in the modern era between, with trade and investment be be between the countries as, it, as that's become much more important. Well, for those who are semi-familiar with the US-British history, some of this sounds familiar from The Crown. How accurate is that series? Well, we could do a whole program going through blow by blow uh, on the, the, the different episodes in The Crown. But um, I think The Crown should be enjoyed for what it is, which uh, is a lot of it is um, uh, done with artistic license. Uh, for example, when Margaret visited LBJ, as we discussed, there are no reports of a limerick contest or a kiss uh, afterwards. Um, it, it, there, there are reports of some quite um, frenetic dancing, uh, not, I mean, I'm not talking about LBJ and Margaret so much as some of the, some of the other uh, guests. Uh, and it was a, it was a great evening, uh, but it wasn't quite uh, uh, as, um, as the Crown portrayed it. You describe the US as royal obsessed. Well, we're doing a whole hour on C-SPAN on the royals. But that's not the only sign, of course. Uh, even if you look at the TV viewing figures, I was quite amazed to learn that the audience for Prince William and Catherine's wedding was a bigger TV audience than for the royal wedding of Prince Charles and Diana Spencer. And that just shows that uh, die mania is big in America. You know, you, you, you could scroll through the TV channels now and probably find a documentary on Diana. It's never gone away, uh, but it just shows that the interest has continued with successive generations. And without putting too fine a point on it, uh, the really the soap opera actually the side of it, which has sadly overtaken the two boys, um, uh, William and Harry, of course, has uh, dominates. Uh, in, in the American news and, and uh, water cooler discussion uh, as, as much as, uh, as, much as um, events between the stars of, a, of American uh, popular life. And you spend quite a bit of time here in the States, don't you? What's your day job? Yes, I'm an assistant editor of the uh, Times, the Times of London, and that makes me the Washington bureau chief here uh, in Washington. I lived and worked here for five years and it became pretty clear to me one of the reasons why I thought to do the book actually was that it's a real conversation point whenever I'm in social gatherings conversation pretty quickly comes round to the royal family what's really happening I'm supposed to know because I'm from the UK of course exactly what's going on behind the curtain but uh, can't always help with, the, with that. Well you also write that 55 million Americans watched the Queen's 1953 coronation, which is a huge number when you think of the number of TVs. Are the Brits as obsessed as we are? That's a good question. I do think the Brits are. If anything, there's a bit too much of it in, in the UK, and so some people get a bit fed up with it. You know, too much royal news, too much gossip. Because one thing about the royal family and the thing I've tried to avoid in the book is that because they are rather private and a lot of interactions happen behind the scenes and a lot of conversation is not recorded, there's not, there's not much video, for example, or diary records of the Queen's personal conversations. Um, the tabloids and the media often tend to fill in the, fill in the gaps with speculation um, and supposition, and what 
I've tried to do in the book is, is to get to um, what was really going on, uh, what we know from the historical record and what I know from people who were involved in, in setting up some of these uh, meetings. Uh, but that's to say that there's a lot of um, media coverage of the royals which isn't, I don't feel, terribly reliable. And, and so it's, it's a bit overwhelming at times in, in, in Britain. You might feel that in America too. You might feel there's too much of it, of course. Uh, and that's, that's ultimately not a great thing for the royal family either, which is it, it needs to maintain a certain level of popular support uh, to, to, to continue. I mean, it's a total anachronism. It's a hereditary family that's had its, um, that's been at the pinnacle of British society and politics for a thousand years. And you wouldn't create a system like that in, in the modern democratic age. And yet, especially Queen Elizabeth II, I feel, uh, became a real linchpin of the constitutional democracy as it's evolved in my country. What was the impact of the 1969 BBC documentary? That's a great question because it was the first time that cameras were ever allowed into uh, Buckingham Palace uh, to see the royals in their private quarters, in their offices, and at play. Uh, there's scenes in it, for example, of Prince Philip keeping up his flying hours by taking a helicopter here or a plane there. Uh, there's, a, there's other scenes of them on the Royal Yacht Britannia. Um, practicing the evacuation procedure from Britannia and having to put on life jackets and jump off in, onto onto another ship, and this went. This was a revelation when it was broadcast uh, in in Britain, but uh, and uh, because the access it, it was just unknown before, and you heard them talking uh, in relaxed terms to each other. In fact, um, a, one of the scenes that's captured is a visit by President Nixon, who goes into the into Buckingham Palace, and he's actually talking to Prince Charles, who's a young man at the time, about aged about 21, supposedly one of the world's most eligible bachelors. And Nixon raises the subject of, oh, um, my daughters follow you very closely on television. And Prince Philip, who's there, he's been briefed that Nixon's a, a bit of a royalist and he's got a, some thoughts about one of his daughters particularly, the one who's not married. Um, Prince Philip says, oh, well, one of the daughters, perhaps not so much, meaning that one of Nixon's daughters had just got married. So there was one who was single who might be interested to follow the activities of a most eligible bachelor in the world. And that's unfortunately when the whole party moves out of a camera shot down a corridor. But this comes up again a year or two later when Prince Charles makes a visit to uh, Washington, his first big trip as Prince of Wales. And funnily enough, he finds himself in almost every situation, like at the baseball park or the wildlife sanctuary or the party in the White House grounds. Somehow, Trisha Nixon has always been placed alongside him, uh, which made from some great pictures. And Charles himself later said, oh, yes, that's when they were trying to fix me up with uh, Trisha Nixon. Did the Queen ever meet FDR? that you know of? She did not meet FDR. No, she didn't travel. She was the first royal ever to fly across the Atlantic, but that was in 1951, after the death of FDR, when she met Truman. Well, she was still a princess, as she, she met Truman. Because, of course, Joe Kennedy was FDR's ambassador for a while. That's, this is a really interesting point that emerges from her formative years in the run-up to the war Kennedy is, becomes a rather unpopular ambassador uh, in Britain because he, for one, cannot see why on earth America should get involved in a war in Europe and makes that pretty clear. That's not what FDR is really thinking. However, FDR is campaigning uh, on keeping America out of any war in Europe. So there's this um, contradiction uh, in, the, in public um, in, 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 the, in what is being presented to the public a bit. Um, and there's this chafing behind the scenes where FDR wants uh, Joseph Kennedy to get with the programme that America will support the UK if it really comes to it. But while he's campaigning for his re-election, he's not going to commit to send British troops into mainland Europe, for example. And so they fall out and eventually Joseph Kennedy is recalled 
but not before quite a famous um, or quite a intriguing meeting happens because um, Kennedy's son, uh, John, John Kennedy, comes to visit on a break from Harvard. He comes to stay and basically have fun in London high society and visits Europe. In fact, he even gets as far as Berlin, I think, on that trip, just to see how things are, sh uh, are shaping down in the run-up to war. And of course, he gets invited to Buckingham Palace for presentation events um, to, uh, to the king and has coffee and has coffee afterwards uh, with the 12-year-old Princess Elizabeth, making the 21-year-old JFK the first, soon to be, later to be president, that Princess Elizabeth uh, ever met. And you just got this extraordinary, we don't know much about the conversation, but you've got an extraordinary scene of little Princess Elizabeth, 21-year-old JFK, soon to be both perhaps the most famous people in the world, just having a, uh, a, a cup of coffee and making chit chat. Actually, Elizabeth at the time uh, was rather keen on the, on the American film Snow White, so that's probably what she talked about. Did that Joe Kennedy history affect her relationship with President John Kennedy? It, there's no indication that that affected it. Um, however, they only met once, um, History, of course, intervened to prevent later meetings. But the the one occasion when they did meet, when JFK came through London after a, uh, a very successful state visit to France with Jackie, uh, was again the subject of a whole episode of The Crown that played up the antagonism between Jackie and the Queen. Um, because Jackie did tell uh, one of her writer friends, I think it was Gore Vidal, that I believe the Queen resented me. Now that was spun out into a whole episode of The Crown where Philip goes all gooey about uh, Jackie and the Queen doesn't like seeing her husband fawning over the, um, the new cover girl uh, of the world. The Queen was a cover girl in, in the 50s, but now she's, she's been totally outshone by, the, uh, by Camelot in, in, the, in the White House. Uh, and, but I don't think there was any real animosity between uh, the, the, the first couple and the Queen because Jackie Kennedy was invited back for a private lunch uh, a year later when she just happened to be privately passing through London, for example. But I, I do say in the book, and I think this is right, that Kennedy was really preferred the society of men to talk politics. I mean, he didn't have any women in his cabinet. Uh, and um, perhaps... Um, conversation didn't flow as easily as it did with, with most other presidents. In November of 1963, though, the Queen did something special that had never been done before after the death of JFK. Yes, and, and this, this is captured in, the, in towards the end of that episode in The Crown, actually, when news breaks, the Queen shares global horror and dismay, of course, and she she asks that the that the bell at Westminster Abbey be rung uh, the next day f uh, consistently for a whole hour. And that's only something that would ever be done for the death of a senior member of the royal family. And that was seen um, it, it, in its day as a remarkable gesture. It finds an echo later uh, in uh, after 9-11, when she asked the, 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 the band at the, at the palace during the changing of the guard, uh, to play uh, the Star Spangled Banner. And of course, there's, all, there's a large crowd outside and many Americans and Brits are moved to tears, uh, but a couple of the royals appear and, and it, is, it was a, seen as a remarkable gesture. And she also attended the 9-11 service and was seen to be singing the American national anthem. Um, and that's, that was extraordinary because she'd never been, she'd never sung been seen singing the, the anthem of another country, which she never sung her own anthem to herself, uh, and showed a, a connection, I think, that comes through from all of the meetings throughout the book, that uh, she really has a strong personal affinity with America and feels it it is the special place that, that Churchill um, set out and that she came to really... Uh, not only it was respected because of the war effort, but she 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 enjoyed 
uh, her relationship with America. She spent private holidays there. She, you know, she's she's a. If you had to, if you ask me, what does the Queen do for fun? It's 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 horses. She's she she's interested in the breeding of her horses, the racing of her horses. She has at, at least five private holidays. I was able to find out about that she spent in in horse country in America. Nineteen seventy six. American Bicentennial. Was that a politically sensitive visit by the Queen to come to the States? In the archives of the Foreign Office, there are some now, it seems, hilarious documents about senior figures in the, in the British civil service, the men in suits, if you like, fretting about whether this visit is appropriate. Should the Queen go? Uh, to help celebrate uh, a country that rebelled against the crown uh, a mere 200 years ago. Um, uh, one uh, ambassador or senior figure writes to another that there'll be a certain amount of ballyhoo and does the Queen want to be associated uh, with this zest in America? And uh, of course the Queen is not bothered by this. This is this is the consternation behind the scenes. But a, a compromise has to be reached, according to the Brits, and so she doesn't arrive until July the sixth, uh, just a couple of days after the actual day. And she doesn't go straight to Washington. She goes to Philadelphia, uh, but that's where the thirteen colonies broke away. So it was rather appropriate. But it turns out, despite all of the misgivings. Of, in the British establishment to be really a fantastically successful trip. Of the 13 presidents that she had diplomatic relations or personal relations with, did they ever use each other for political purposes <laughs> to bolster images? Yeah, you, you've, you've hit a nail there because uh, talking about the 76 visit, that well, this was in July 76, it was in the run-up to the uh, convention the Republican convention, and Ford hadn't quite closed down the nomination. So some of the guests, and it was very hard to get on these guest lists. These, it, it, this comes across every single time there's a state visit. The scrambling and the scrabbling to get in the room, to be on the amongst the 120 or so people invited to the White House for this dinner. But several seats are set aside by Ford for senior figures from states which have yet to come down either for him or Reagan uh, in the in the battle for the nomination. And um, I believe, well, history tells us it, it tipped his way, right? While she was visiting the White House on that visit, though, Jack Ford made an appearance. What happened? The son of the president. Yes, this is the time when she uh, is being led uh, into the White House. They've, there's been the formal greetings. Uh, and uh, Betty Ford, of course, is absolutely determined this trip will go to the book and be perfect. She's organised everything. She's made sure the dress code is understood, that everybody's, everybody knows the protocol. Everybody's been given uh, a primer on how to greet the Queen as Your Majesty first time, ma'am the second time. Prince Philip is uh, your Royal Highness the first time, sir, the second time, and how, when to touch the royals and, and uh, how, to, <laughs> how, to, how to greet them and what to serve them. However, when the elevator doors open uh, to go into the private area of the White House, um, there's young Jack and he's lost, uh, he can't find his uh, shirt cuffs. So he's, there, he's, bare, he's bare chested, the shirt's open, no shoes, no, I don't know if he's got his socks on. Uh, there, there, there he is standing there in, in, front of, uh, in front of the Queen. Of course, Betty, Betty Ford is rather mortified. Uh, the Queen laughs it off. Oh, don't worry, I've got one of those at home, you know. <laughs> President Carter, the Queen Mother, what happened? And how big a deal was this? Yeah. Um, so, again, this, Carter is another president the Queen only met once, and that was on during a visit, during a big set piece uh, event like a, like a G8 summit in, in London. And there's an intriguing photograph before dinner that shows that we've got, it's gone in the book actually, it shows Carter holding hands uh, with the Queen Mother uh, for the photograph on the way. And they seem to be getting along rather well. 
However, uh, the, st the story that emerges after the dinner is that uh, Carter felt he, he got on so famously with the Queen Mother uh, that he gave her a, a parting kiss. Uh, she described it as a, uh, a kiss on the lips and that she took a step backwards, but not far enough. Uh, and she told a biographer, you know, that... Uh, no, she, she told uh, a house guest that nobody has done that since my late husband died. Uh, that, was, that was George VI, some 25 years earlier, of course. Um, reflections differ a little because Carter subsequent to this coming out in the press. So you ask, well, was it a big deal at the time? It wasn't a big deal at the time. It didn't come out, it didn't emerge until several years later when the Queen Mother told this story and it, and it started to feature in the British media. Then there was a, uh, a bit of fuss about it. Uh, but Carter addresses it in one of his uh, biographical books and talks a little about how he got on with the Queen and how they what they discussed, but also that he he bade fa farewell to the Queen Mother and, and did, it was not as described uh, and no offence, of course, was intended. And he, again, was mortified that it should have come out quite like that. Uh, but I think it, it sort of added to my impression that the, the royals were ra rather wary of, of Carter, didn't quite know uh, how, to, how to handle him ex exactly. He was, he was probably the president who was least like the royal, I mean, nobody's like the royal family who's inherited all this wealth, I, I suppose. But coming from his, um, his, you know, his, his, his rural um, background, not being, um, I, 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 not having this, this, um, these connections with all these world leaders and this great history of, um, of, dipl of, of, of global diplomacy, so we say that. Carter himself admits that his only previous brush with royalty was when he was a tourist on a, on a Georgia visit uh, a few years before, where he peered through the railings uh, at Buckingham Palace as, as, as a tourist, a kind of wide-eyed uh, feeling. And so they were, they were really chalk and cheese, uh, those, uh, the, the, the Queen and, and Carter. Not, not that the Queen herself uh, uh, would have let that disturb relations in any way. I mean, as I say, she was a consummate diplomat, the jewel, the jewel of the diplomatic service, and, and she regarded it as her job, especially when there was some awkwardness uh, in the relationship, either in politics or personally between them, that she would make an extra effort to smooth things over and, and put everyone at their ease and, and really make sure that there weren't any of these incidents that got in into the media and overshadowed uh, the, the the true purpose of the of the event, which was to make improve relations. Well, often we Mer we Americans don't understand the rules about touching the royals, and it yeah. was in 1991 that she visited and she met Alice Fraser. Right. So this is one of those visits that gets set up on the side of a state visit, where the visiting royal dignitaries can meet real Americans, and so. Um, Alice Fraser was an, an African-American lady living in the south uh, east of Washington uh, who had recently got uh, uh, some public housing or some or some low, she'd recently got some budget housing um, her, her own roof over her own head for, for the first time and she'd been she'd been briefly you know the Queen's coming through with Barbara Bush uh, we're gonna we're going to watch some uh, sporting displays and she's going to come through your place to see how this area is being improved by, uh, by the authorities. And she was warned that the Queen, um, would, she wouldn't eat. Uh, she, she, she just wanted to say, to, to, to do the photo opportunity and say hello. Of course, Alice Fraser spent the whole night preparing uh, numerous dishes uh, in her kitchen, uh, which uh, all the journalists who visited at the time were very keen to try. But the Queen uh, would, protocol dictated, of course, that she that she wouldn't do it. But she was she was also very keen to give the Queen a hug, which she did. And there are some I have to say this word awkward comes up again. A, I think if you if you could search the book, the word awkward would appear quite a lot. Uh, the, 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 there's a very awkward photograph of the Queen. Um, smiling but looking faintly alarmed uh, as, Al as Alice Fraser gives her a very warm big hug because frankly nobody ever hugs the Queen. 
uh, certainly not in public. Uh, but as, as Alice Fraser explained afterwards, uh, she said she felt as a fellow mother, she felt an attachment and uh, warmth towards the Queen and wanted to express her feelings in, in her way, even though she'd been briefed not to touch the Queen, I think she was determined to, um, to make an impression. And once again, what you hear from the, the Queen or the palace on her behalf is, of, of course, um, the Queen was delighted to meet such a, such a friendly person. You know, the, the, the last thing the Queen wants to do is to have her visit become uh, some sort of uh, microscope, uh, on, uh, the, the, especially that embarrasses uh, her hosts, the, the, the presidents or, 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 or the people that she meets. Uh, but on this occasion, this photo went around the world. This was front page news. And like a lot of times when things go a bit awry, that moment becomes one of the best known uh, photographs or, of, of, the, of the trip. And curiously, providing uh, things don't go too uh, awry, uh, it, it seems to add to the general uh, warmth of the of the impression that's created by the Queen and, and that, that's her goal is to, to cement uh, this warm glow between the countries that, who are supposed to have this special relationship. Well, we want to show some video and this is from 2007. George W. Bush was president. Here it is. The American people are proud to welcome your majesty back to the United States, a nation you've come to know very well. After all, you've dined with 10 U.S. presidents. You helped our nation celebrate its bicentennial in, 17, in 1976. <laughs> she gave me a look that only a mother could give a child. I wondered whether I should start this toast saying, when I was here in 1776. <laughs> that was her final state visit. That's right. And you can tell that there's a real warmth uh, with President Bush um, that developed from her relationship with his father, actually, because George W. Bush was invited to the first lunch that she had in back in 1991 at the White House with George H. W. Bush. Only Barbara Bush had put him down the table uh, and had said, well, I put my Texan son uh, down the other end of the table, ma'am. And she, and she said, well, is, is he the black sheep of the family? And of course, George W. Bush can hear this. Um, and he, then he pipes up. Um, well, maybe. Well, who's the black sheep in your family? Uh, and, so, and so it begins the banter as we the banter between uh, the, the, the Bush family and, and, the, and the royals uh, uh, developed in a, in a friendly way. And I think the fact that George W. Bush refers to it in those familial terms, a look a mother would only give a child, um, reflects how there was a family almost connection between the royal couple between the Queen and, and, and that Bush family, because partly because of the, of the, of the history, uh, and just partly because um, they, they, they clicked, they, 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 they got each other. The cover photo on your book, Royal Audience, where was that taken? So that's, uh, what, one thing I would say is that, one thing I would say is that the two most famous photographs of the Queen with an American president are both with Ronald Reagan. So there's the horse ride we talked about in Windsor Park in 1982. Then on the follow-up visit, Reagan wants the Queen to come to California to see his place uh, and to do a return horse ride uh, with his own horses. Now, unfortunately, it rains and rains and rains and the horse ride has to be called off. But they still have this big dinner uh, uh, in, in California. Uh, and the photographers were ready because the, the, the speech had been given out, it had been prepared. So there was a joke coming and the, there was a laugh line coming for the Queen where she says, I, I know that America has adopted a lot of our British traditions, but I didn't realise the weather was one of them. And Reagan throws his head back and slaps the table and, and, the, and the photographer captures it perfectly in this picture, I think. 
How close did Queen Elizabeth and Ronald Reagan become over the years? The reason for their closeness, which was real, uh, was on several levels, but the main one was, we've talked about the horse ride that they shared that took a lot of organizing. There was a lot of transatlantic traffic between the men in suits again, the civil servants, to uh, arrange what type of horse, what type of saddle, what are they gonna wear, where are they gonna go, what are the Secret Service agents gonna do, how are they gonna protect the president when he's galloping or trotting around uh, the grounds uh, of Windsor. But s simultaneously to this, uh, Argentina had invaded a British territory, the Falkland Islands in the South Atlantic. And when Reagan was making his visit, a British task force uh, was on its way to do battle with the Ar Argentinian occupiers uh, of the Falkland Islands, which is a crown territory. But moreover, the Queen's son, Andrew, uh, is serving uh, as a helicopter pilot uh, with, with this task force and British troops are getting killed and injured. Helicopter pilots are being shot at. And so you've got this remarkable split screen that on the one hand, there's this seemingly frivolous uh, spectacle of the horse ride being organized between London and Washington. On the other hand, different channels, but I think aware of each other, um, are organizing rather secretly American help uh, for the Brits, satellite photographs, refueling of ships, uh, going to the Falkland Islands. Not This doesn't come out, a lot of this, till 20 years later. So. The, the Queen knows in, in this, at this particular point just how Ronald Reagan is really helping behind the scenes. He sends off Haig to do some negotiation to try and resolve it diplomatically. It proves impossible. But uh, Reagan throughout is committed to helping the British with the military uh, victory in the Falklands, which, which he does. It's not all due to the Queen. He's developing his relationship with Margaret Thatcher at the time, who... There was a great mutual admiration there, of course. Uh, but the Queen puts the icing on the cake. Uh, she makes sure that when Reagan's coming to Europe, actually for some events like G7 and NATO, that there's a British leg of the trip because he's keen to do the horse ride. And this is kind of a reward uh, in some way, but a kind of a thank you for the help in the Falklands. And this begins that cements really the Queen's respect uh, for Reagan uh, uh, as a guy, as a president, as a leader. Um, and it means so much to her as her country's figurehead, but also as a mother who's worried about the safety of her, of her, of her own son. And when it's that personal, uh, it, it, it means something a little bit more. Well, there's a third leg in this stool, which is the official British government, the prime minister, whoever it happens to be at the time, is the palace, are the palace and the prime minister coordinating? Oh yes, yes. Um, behind the scenes, uh, the bigger speeches will be will be drafted through Downing Street, where the prime minister, uh, the prime minister's residence, um, through the civil service. The state visits. The queen gets to host two state visits a year. Got to host the late queen. Got to host two state visits a year. Uh, these are determined by the government, by the Prime Minister. They are for important uh, foreign leaders, and she hosted more than leaders from more than 100 different countries. Uh, only two get the honour, the, if you like, the, the, all the pomp and circumstance, uh, or perhaps an address to Parliament, a glittering uh, dinner at Buckingham Palace, a, a return... Uh, perhaps at the U.S. ambassador's residence or the ambassador's residence or, you know, there's a, the whole, a, a state visit involves at least three, if not four days of ceremonies and speeches and uh, media opportunities, which are fantastic uh, opportunities for the visiting dignitary as much as for Britain to either um, thank, give a thank you, give a reward to a country that's been helpful or to try and win round a country that where there's some problem in the relationship. So um, the government will be very much involved, and this is especially the case um, with le when later on, as I say, there was concerns about Obama's commitment to Britain and Europe. He gets a state visit. 
There were concerns about Donald Trump's commitment to uh, Europe and uh, to, especially in the wake of the Brexit vote in Britain, when we voted to leave the European Union, we were looking for trading, uh, new trading relationships. And so what's the top card that the Prime Minister at the time, Theresa May, can play? Oh, would you like a state visit? Love, love a state visit, says Donald Trump, yes. Well, this is from 2011, President Obama at Buckingham Palace. Mr. President, I firmly believe that the strength of our links and many shared interests will continue to ensure that the, when the United States and the United Kingdom stand together, our people and other people of goodwill around the world will be more secure and can become more prosperous. To Her Majesty the Queen, to the vitality of the special relationship between our peoples, and in the words of Shakespeare, to this blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. The music started a bit early there, didn't it? So what, what happened there was that the band, which by the way was on the balcony above them, uh, thought that it had its cue when Obama said Her Majesty the Queen. They thought he'd finished his speech, so they struck up uh, the national anthem. However, Obama still had a few words left to say, and he thought, oh, this is nice. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a movie almost where there's background music and uh, I can finish my speech uh, uh, to, to, to the anthem. So he, he persists with uh, finishing his speech. Were the so-called men in suits, Mr. Charter, relieved when he used the term special relationship as he had used special partnership early in, in his administration? That's absolutely right. When, when Britain first heard the Obama administration talking of a special partnership, um, or alarm bells started ringing. And then when they invited the Japanese prime minister to be the first one into the Oval Office from overseas, uh, there was almost a meltdown in Whitehall, you can imagine, in, in the British establishment. And so Gordon Brown was a prime minister then. He managed to get out pretty quickly and was the next one after the Japanese prime minister, I think. But Obama also knew by this stage, of course, how much it meant uh, to, uh, to the Brits. Uh, I I, whether it came up in private conversation with the Queen in some way, um, we don't really know. But it would have been obvious from the questioning of reporters in press conferences uh, and the coverage in the media um, when this phrase special relationships began to seemingly be dropped by the Obama administration. What can we do to get things back on track? Well, as I say, they were when Obama made his first visit for a G20, he's only one leader of all the 20 nations gets invited up to Buckingham Palace for lunch, and that's the American president. What does it mean to be a royalist? Yes, that's a good question. And I think in the UK terms, it means to be supportive of this institution um, as an important function of our British governance, but also our way of life. You know, on Christmas Day, uh, m many Brits would settle down in front of the television after Christmas lunch, and they will watch the monarch come on at three o'clock and deliver their Christmas message. And I, I, I personally feel that this became such a, a fixture with the Queen uh, that it will definitely continue uh, with, uh, with King Charles now uh, on the throne, as it's one point where we get to hear from them directly. And to be a royalist really means that you've made, you've somehow squared this strange contradiction in British life, that we are a democracy, a very old democracy, and yet our head of state is not elected, they're born into it. And to, to somehow make that co contradiction reality, the royal family has to strive to re remain popular, um, has to appear, um, at least in its senior members, to be absolutely focused on the well-being and promotion uh, of my country. But this system cannot be sustained 
without popular support. And we've seen episodes where the royals have got it wrong, like over the death of Diana when the Queen was perceived to have stayed too long in Scotland with her sons and not come down to London to meet the grieving crowds or see all the flowers outside Buckingham Palace. And public opinion began to turn and Tony Blair was a Prime Minister at the time. He, he, he realised this and as a, as a royalist himself, he began to step in and do his own PR for the royal family to recover the situation. So on both sides of the equation, um, there, there, there's a, both sides have to be committed to sustaining this institution. September 2022, the Queen dies. President Biden attends her funeral. Here's some brief remarks from him. We've had an opportunity to meet with an awful lot of consequential people. But I can say that the ones who stand out in your mind are those whose relationship and interaction with you are consistent with their reputation. She was the same uh, in person as, she, as her image, decent, honorable, and all about service. 70 years, 14 presidents during her reign. Was President Biden correct in your view about what he said about her? Oh, I really think uh, he made a terrific tribute there. And it really meant a lot to the Brits because there had been some media coverage about how certainly members of his family, like his own mother, did not like the royal family. And she famously... Famously Irish, of course, the Bidens. Right, exactly. Um, Famously, his, his mother had told him when he, when he first, maybe not famously, <laughs> but uh, his mother had told him when he first, as a senator, was coming to the UK as, as a Senate group that was going to meet the Queen, don't you kiss her ring, don't you bow down to her. And his mother had apparently once stayed in a hotel where she was convinced the Queen had slept in the bed, so his, his mother slept on the floor. I mean, at least this is a story that Biden tells. Uh, and of course, he's committed to um, uh, I, the, his, 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 Irish, uh, his Irish roots and Irish republicanism. Uh, but uh, what the, 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 the real picture with Biden was much more nuanced. He, for example, during the Falklands conflict, was very active in the Senate in promoting support for Britain uh, as, as, as a great ally of America. So. There were obviously, there were signs that Biden's not going to trash the special relationship uh, before. Uh, but the fact that he warmed so much to the Queen, rather like Obama before him, I think, Biden emerged from his Windsor Castle meeting. And what did he say? Uh, she reminded me of my mother. Now that's a real compliment coming from Biden. The mother, his mother is a very special person in his life. And his mother, by the way, was very anti-royalist. Uh, uh, and yet he used that particular description uh, of the Queen in a, in a very warm and affectionate way. And I think it showed something about the strength of the relationship between our countries that presidents, even if they have some an antipathy towards British accent, actions, British politics, they, they warm to our head of state. There's a difference, of course, that a struggle that, that sometimes happens with America is that the, your head of state is also your head of government. And so they are much more indelibly associated with certain politics. So the royals can rise above politics. They've got that ability to just be one step removed from the political fray, which really helps them. 1952 to 2022, 70 years. Queen Elizabeth sat on the throne, the undisputed jewel of UK diplomacy. Our guest, David Charter, describes her. He is the US editor of the Times of London, and he's also the author of this book, Royal Audience, 70 Years, 13 Presidents, One Queen's Special Relationship with America. We appreciate your time here on C-SPAN. Thank you so much for having me, it's been great. Q&A programs are available on our website 
or as a podcast on our C-SPAN Now app.